uh, specifically quality and quality management, regulatory compliance, and you know a variety of businesses. So you know he brings in the perspective of what it would take to actually make quality assurance, quality management, quality control. Uh, a success in any organization and he's looked at a variety of technologies of course machine vision being one of them but of course you know technology by itself is a is a strong advocate of you know <clears throat> technology by itself is compl- complete nonsense unless it's used to solve a business problem so he's a very vocal and uh, doesn't hold back any words and can actually bring uh, forth his views and he's a strong proponent of how you can actually use technology to solve real world problems, right? So it's it's all about problem solving. Technology is just uh, a means to the end. And uh, with him, he's, he's right now started um, uh, a consulting practice. So after a number of years in the industry, he started a consulting practice. He's based out of Vancouver, Canada, works with a number of global organizations as part of his consulting practice. and. We've been associated with uh, Mr. Suhas for a uh, for a year now, more recently, and uh, you know his uh, visionary thinking sort of impressed me, and I invited him, and he graciously accepted to be part of this webinar. Thank you, Suhas, and, and look forward to an interesting discussion with you. Um, the uh, co-panelist is also someone who now comes from the other side of the. Uh, uh, equation, not as a practitioner, but as a developer. So we've been um, we've been in your shoes as well, Robert. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Robert and uh, Robert Couture. He's the CTO and founder of V V4 Vector Technologies, and based out of North Carolina in the U.S. And he actually also has, I think, a background from Canada. He did his uh, graduation from the University of Waterloo, and uh, after his complete. Uh, completion. He has been um, working on machine vision and integrating machine vision technologies for uh, a greater part of two decades, right from 1999. And um, so, after you know, I think uh, a, a large stint in in the industries, he founded Fourth Vector Technologies and four, 15 years back. And he's been uh, working. Uh, on a number of interesting projects and you know in my last discussions he also shared with me his experience of having uh, worked in India I think more than te- a decade ago so he, he, he is quite adventurous goes wherever uh, challenges and problems uh, take him and you know with his diverse set of experience would love to hear from him as well on what you know the trends are uh, in from a practitioner's perspective of machine vision. So thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Robert and Suhas. And um, so before we get started, I, I would love to learn a little bit more uh, about the audience. And so what um, would, you know, um, would love to sort of get a, a panel. I think there'll be more people joining. It's, it's about uh, 10 minutes into the webinar. Um, so if you could, you know, start the first poll in what, you know, what's your familiarity with machine vision, right? So a poll should just, uh, come up and I'd love to, um, you know, if you could take a, a second just to enter what, what is uh, machine vision. So basically, you know, have have not heard or not used, no idea about what machine vision is. Now, you've heard about the technology, but you've not used it. And uh, you've actually used it. You're a practitioner, but you've not really seen any results. And, you know, the more mature of you have used and also have seen successful results. So I'd like to learn a little bit about what it is. So the poll is in front of you. Okay, about 50% completed. Uh, we'll wait a few more seconds for the others to just uh, put in their vote. So it gives us a, some perspective on. Okay. So I think there's an even split, but mostly have heard but not used. Okay, great. So that's then you're in the right place and have, have not heard, have not, neither have used. So this is going to be a little basic, then we, we will keep it to a little bit of a basic uh, uh, audience, but a, a number of you have also used and seen successful results. So, okay, we got a, a wide range. All right. So uh, thanks for that. Now, so with that, I would like to, you know, just begin by, you know, a practitioner's, I would say, 
uh, not a practitioner's perspective, but you know, from a quality perspective. And you know, let's start with you know where machine vision is really applicable, right? So we know that machine vision, the primary use is in automating quality control. So you have some process which is manual, and you want to automate this now. But let's take a step back, and you know, Suhas, if I could ask you, you know, what um, are you know the causes of these quality defects, right? So you, in your decades of experience with industries, you've encountered a number of uh, quality issues which you have to deal with. Okay. Now, what are some of the main reasons why they occur? What are the? Can you give us a little bit of insights and background into the the the, the wide variety and of of not only the causes but also how it manifests in uh, manufacturing? Um, Certainly. So. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Raghava, for the introduction. Uh, I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, and as you rightly said, yeah, I, I have been across uh, many verticals in electrical, electronics, automation, process control, uh, um, and in global situations. So I've seen quite a bit. Uh, the first thing I would like to ensure is that uh, I just heard this morning that the situation in Bangalore is not very well. So I trust all of you are staying safe and healthy, extremely important. Yeah. So coming to defects uh, in manufacturing, when you talk about manufacturing, uh, since my expertise and all the experience has been in electrical, electronic, uh, mix of both um, and everything related to that, not so much into life sciences and food. Um, I'm, uh, currently I'm working on some of those. So in a few months, I will have a lot more insights on those. Uh, but they have unique processes, uh, uh, needs, uh, and regulatory regime. But the rest of the industry, typically when you say manufacturing, you are talking right from material receipt incoming. Uh, on shop floor, you will have different kinds of sub-assembly. Till you put a final product together, uh, which will go through its own uh, functional testing, um, and if organizations are ahead of the curve, they may do some additional uh, long-term reliability tests, etc. So the typical defects um, uh, which uh, you will come across uh, when you look at this whole end-to-end -end manufacturing uh, up to packaging, incorrect parts, wrong parts, damaged parts, missing parts, right? Of course, functional failures are not meeting the spec if it is a mechanical item, not necessarily dead, but not meeting the specs. And you have done a lot for that. And at the end of the game, it's all about capturing the right information, whether it is the QR code, barcode, serial number on the label, on the packaging. So um, these are all the range of issues which uh, you will see. This, this is probably 90 plus percent of the defects, as we call them. Uh, what are the, some of the drivers? Right? Um, every organization is at a different level of maturity when it comes to defining, developing, and implementing process and controls. Right? So the one major reason always is a lack of adequate process controls and automation. Uh, many, many organizations, even today, uh, it's surprising, but even today, they completely rely on human eyes to do important inspections, whether it is a product meeting tolerances, whether it's a voltage, some of the electrical parameter readings pass fail. Um, but uh, unfortunately, even with the best intention, as I said on LinkedIn and many times uh, in many discussions, it's uh, all impossible for any human being, even with the best intention. I consider myself to be one of the best inspectors even today. But uh, there are human factors like health. Uh, there is normal behavior after 20, 30 minutes, we lose attention because attention span is another challenge. So that uh, results into a lot of escapes, a lot of incorrect decisions, passing good material as defective and the other way as well. Uh, so this is where uh, automation plays a very, very important role. Um, 
and in the later discussion we are going to talk about how to humanly do automation but um, that's a big gap i have seen and this is across the globe i worked in 30 40 50 different countries a lot of suppliers of all magnitudes consistently uh, this is one challenge uh, i have seen and uh, last but not least uh, there is no structured approach and mechanism to collect important data and do something with that data to prevent these defects. Uh, people love firefighting because firefighters always get a lot of credit, but that's uh, so lack of automation, too much dependence on people to do critical inspection, even at high speed. Uh, and yeah, no structured approach and uh, mechanism. Got it, got it. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, and it's interesting to note that you said globally, this is a problem. So this is not a localized problem, but humans behave the same everywhere. Right. Uh, just to qualify that further, uh, of course, uh, as Industry 4.0 is driven very aggressively in North America and parts of Europe, uh, some of the non-regulatory industries, because life, sciences, pharma, medical, they get always a pass because you're playing with people's lives. So they always can delay de implementation of such technology. But rest, uh, auto, especially automobile and high volume, they are moving into a lot of automation, trying to deploy 4.0. Along with that, what they call quality 4.0, which is not actually, but that's how they claim. But rest, yes. Um, of course, in the Asian context, I see, I saw over the decades, more challenges, more dependence on humans compared to West, just because of the cost of people, not because they wanted to embrace technology. It was more driven by in US and Canada, you can't afford somebody sitting there and inspecting uh, three ships yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's true. And it's, you know, it's just physically, it's not about um, human behavior. It's just physically impossible. Yeah. You, you start it's just impractical. Limits of uh, yes. physical uh, inspection. Now, yes. uh, if I can switch to Robert. Now, uh, Robert, now you've been uh, working on the solutions for this, right? So uh, there are problems caused by machine vision. Now solutions, uh, sorry, problems caused due to human inspection, which causes quality control. And, and machine vision is obviously a, a, a good solution. Now, um, coming from a North American market perspective, what would you say, you know, especially in these times, right? Now, what are the trends you're seeing with machine vision in terms of quality control? And, and especially, you know, has you seen any, uh, you know, differences or any unique perspectives that you have to share when it comes to the COVID times that we live in? Thank you for the introduction. Um, so, you know, COVID has been definitely kind of interesting. It, it put uh, a severe break on the North American uh, manufacturing environment. So pretty much from April through July of last year, um, things were pretty much uh, shut down unless you were deemed a critical manufacturer. And things have, and so what ended up happening after, um, in particular, there was a number of deaths with some chicken processing plants. And so uh, OSHA uh, came the, basically put the hammer down that uh, all large manufacturers were required to have pandemic protocols put in place. And that ended up getting pushed down to integrators. So even though that some integrators that are a smaller shop did not necessarily have to have these protocols in place, we were now dictated by our clients that we had to have our own protocols. So there was a lot of uh, kind of shuffling going around on what needed to be done. Um, uh, internally, we had to uh, implement some uh, contact tracing. So we had to have basically our own little app for visitors and employees when they came in, answering questions every day, you know, doing their temperature checks and, and everything else. So, uh, you know, along with, um, just trying to organize and, you know, how do we deal with remote employees and, um, you know, how we continue to serve our customers that are, you know, part of the major uh, supply chain. But things are, things are definitely picking up, but the challenges that we're running into right now 
is availability of the workforce. So even though um, most manufacturing employees have been vaccinated, there's a challenge that um, whether it's the first dose or second dose, there's some additional time off that's being uh, needed because of different reactions to, uh, to the vaccine. And so that is creating a certain amount of inconsistencies within the labor force, but also the challenge of the lack of reliable um, access to childcare. And so when your kids are not in school and they're doing remote learning, somebody needs to be around because by the time you get home, they're gonna tear the house apart. So, um, and that falls into, you know, a dynamic where, you know, one parent is having to being forced to work from home. And well, when you're in manufacturing, you need eyes on the situation and that's just not possible. So there's, even though we have millions of people out of work, um, there is uh, a, a labor shortage. And so there's this, uh, you know, back and forth on trying to get uh, people back to work. And so that's really what's holding us up at this point in time, as far as manufacturing and, you know, adding to that. So those that are on the front line, uh, working within packaging and producing parts and such, um, they're having to do overtime simply because they don't have enough people on, on the line. And that overtime is in itself creating problems. So there, uh, the need for automation and quality inspection, um, there's a lot more quoting that's going on uh, this year than previous years. And it's, it's been uh, definitely interesting uh, within that respect. Wow, okay, so there's the number of drivers. So, you know, it says you put the accelerator on the pedal, you put, put the foot on the pedal when it comes to adoption of these, or at least interest, right? So mm -hmm. that sounds like, yeah, we are, we're seeing a lot of interest in, in the Indian market as well. Of course, we are, we, it's not the best time in terms of uh, the situation right now, you know, compared to like a few months ago, but uh, we believe that the, the fundamentals and the, uh, and if not, COVID has done anything but acted as a catalyst to, to this adoption. And uh, um, that that's, seems to be the trend here as well. Um, so right. so, so uh, I will echo, just quick uh, note, yeah. uh, I will echo Robert's uh, experience and findings. Uh, I've been talking to a lot of leaders across uh, North America, mostly US, some Canada over the last few months. Uh, life sciences, like pharma, medical, biotech, their biggest complaint today, I'm trying to help them on many aspects of quality. Yeah. Yes, we love your solution. The first thing we need is people. Can you find us some good, real good talent? That's the number mm. one, top of the list. Mm, interesting. So, yeah, you, you you can't just replace people, people like this, right? So you, you, no, you, can't. you need <laughs> to have specialized people to even think about automation. And speaking of this, yes. you know, what, what, is, what are some of the things that you've seen in general, uh, Suhas, when it comes to automation as a solution for quality control? So what are, you know, some of the, uh, you know, I would say high level do's and don'ts when someone is thinking about automation in the context of yeah. automating quality? So yeah, so good segue from the discussion you just had with Robert. Uh, uh, what I've been involved in many automation projects over the decades. Uh, one thing I have learned myself uh, and realized uh, is the purpose of any automation should not be ever to replace the people who are working in the plant. That's very inhuman in general, right, in any economy. But Given today's context, uh, what COVID-19 has done to the world and especially manufacturing, most impacted outside the four sectors, right? Life sciences, food, logistics, and pharma, right? Everything else is severely impacted and we don't know when it's going to be normal, right? So it's even more important, uh, I would say imperative that leaders think about the human factor when they're automating. So the technology, what your technology you are trying to deploy, it should augment and facilitate better work from your team. And if your staff, which has been with you for years, they can certainly do a lot more value-added job if you take inspection out, right? 
so there is no need to replace so that's one of the most important things uh, i would say uh, and automate the key decision steps in the process where as i said earlier it is humanly impossible to consistently reliably 24 hours a day deliver accurate results because the employees themselves will not be happy if there are continuous escapes uh, because end of the day the whole business works for one person that's the customer so if you are shipping defects whether it is wrong products incorrect products damaged products missing stuff uh, when the customer is not going to be happy i i don't think any single employee ever is happy right so they will appreciate if you facilitate better decision making through automation it's a win 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 right and then and that can drive significant improvement because you will have gold mine of data if you have the right people in the organization uh, that's the beauty of automation if you do it right uh, in deployed at the right places um, and involve so what are the, some of the do's always involve all the right stakeholders i have seen and maybe in my younger days i made this mistake as well i am very assertive being indian um, i want to get things done i used to kick lot of ass i would push through projects and then at the end of the day you would realize oh my god the operators are not happy because mm-hmm. i never considered their challenges their view point so yeah uh, listening to uh, the key stakeholders adapting keeping them updated throughout the process extremely important getting the buy in right it's always about yeah. getting the buy in true very true that's that's a great answer yeah so you know we we find that as well when we implement projects that you know we take one perspective and then when we go to implement it's you know if you've not considered the actual users the operators and we run into a lot of issues and right. so uh, yeah one one of so uh, it's very exciting like in design uh, the designers whether it is hardware or software uh, they see some new chip or new technology ai dl ml and they say okay let me do something right but is there a customer for that and similarly here uh, manufacturing leaders uh, or quality leaders they see solutions like qualitas and they say wow my god this looks sexy let's do this but they don't ensure that there is a fit right there has to be a fit uh, you do need to do the homework yeah yeah so true um and robert from a solutions and integrator perspective so what are some of the things that you've come across which you know is reasons for um, you know either failures in vision systems or you know reasons for why uh, solutions never take off hands down it, it usually boils down to system architecture so um 80% of a, a project success is reliant upon the lighting and optics you know this is all before you know integrating your system looking at items it really boils down to the you know the lighting and the optics now when it when it comes to system design with with machine vision the the whole premise is you want to um increase the contrast on items that you are looking for and you know what is the measurement you're going to take then what you want to do is you want to suppress the contrast of any items that you really don't care about and then third it's about um minimizing the impact of external factors so in when i first started machine vision LED lighting just wasn't applicable. Yeah, uh, it wasn't bright enough, it wasn't uh the uh, the technology wasn't there. So, you know, back in 99 we were literally going down to Home Depot and getting halogen lights. And uh in those days, um with halogen lights, uh if something gets if the light gets bumped and it's been used or running for the last 8 hours, it it will pop the filament on. So things are significantly easier today with um LED lighting uh we can drive up in, in strobe intensities to a high level where uh external uh 
sodium lamps and the facilities are no longer impacting us. Um, you know, we're not having to worry about sunlight coming through a window. So LEDs have driven uh, reliability within the market uh, tremendously. But there's also um, a math and a, and a science behind it. They're um, coming from an optics background. I have a certain level of appreciation to, um, to the math behind it. So um, the aspect of cameras, the pixel sizes are getting so small that now we have to actually take into consideration that when we're doing measurements and such with machine vision, how fine can that light source actually focus down on the pixels? Now, uh, prior uh, pixel sizes were, you know, six microns, five microns, not a problem. But now when you're getting down to two and three microns on the pixel sizes, and if you're using a red light to take measurement, your the smallest area in which a red light can focus in on can easily span two or three pixels. So you may have a five megapixel camera, but the reality is you only have a two megapixel resolution on it. And so, and a lot of that has to do with the drivers within the market of cell phones. So as things have progressed along and more and more pixels is a marketing ploy in order to thinking that you're getting the next generation of capabilities. But reality is, is that noise has increased uh, as your pixel sizes de uh, decrease and the overall flexibility on it has, uh, has um, it, it impacts it more. So a perfect example, is doing an application where uh, we had a robot that was picking up seeds in order to put into genetic test wells uh, prior to being crushed. And that allows them to do DNA analysis on uh, various samples and, and such. Well, lettuce seeds, I'm not sure if you've ever seen any, um, they're literally a little skinnier than a millimeter and about four millimeters wide, uh, it's four millimeters long. Well, we're sitting down and doing the math on it um, red light just was not going to work. We ended up actually ended up having to use blue light. And that presented a challenge uh, with it because we had um, the bowl that we were picking up from. It had to be um, um, such that static electricity wasn't going to hold the seeds. And so we ended up having to use some special materials in order to compensate for the ability for the blue light to be used and at the same time choosing material in which the static is no longer a problem. And so there was a lot of trade-offs that ended up having to occur within that. But um, so kind of backing up, it, it really, there is an art to this. It may seem like black magic. Um, and if you're gonna take the approach of, let's just buy the equipment, slap it together and we'll make it, you know, we'll make it up in software. Well, the reality is, is that you got to light it right instead of trying to write around it. And, and that's um, that's just the challenges with, with machine vision is that, you know, it's it's a lot of it boils down to uh, understanding the fundamentals, you know, to the system. Sure, right. Yeah, that's, I think with a lot of um, solutions that I've seen in the market, people just start from the software, right? It's so easy to, to go, work on especially with ai and deep learning you can download something from github model your um, you know application in, in like a prototype in a lab environment and then when you go uh, deploy it on into production whole different story and you know you see things uh, which are you know duct taped around you know different cameras and, and, and lighting and and it uh, just a you know it wants it won't survive a production environment in a shift right and so I think that's that's really the key difference, um, and I uh, I totally agree with you here. It's it's the fundamentals, the architecture, and the image acquisition, which really makes the difference. And a lot of people don't understand that. So thanks for sharing that, Robert. It's very interesting about your uh, light theory. It's first, uh, you know, I hadn't considered that in terms of you know how pixel size is actually is it influenced or how the light wavelength is actually influenced by the pixel size. It's you know, quite uh, yeah, modular transfer excellent. functions. It's important to be looking right. at your spec sheets for your, not only for, for your, your sensors, but also your lens as well. Lens as well, yeah, absolutely. And your lines per, per mm, right? To make sure that you have the right resolution of the lens matching the pixel sizes in your cameras. Um, hey, just a and, quick interjection. Uh, uh, just seeing a few chats about uh, issues with audio. Just wanted to okay. check if everyone's able to 
hear us loud and clear uh, please do confirm on the chat if you can hear us uh, you know loud and clear or if we should increase our volume great okay okay great thanks 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 everyone for chipping in yeah over yeah. to you mr avar yeah thanks avi for checking that in so um, and you know i uh, along this the same lines you know so what are some of the uh, trends you are seeing today so you know these are fundamentals lighting optics cameras software that the, the architecture is you know is uh, fundamental hasn't changed won't probably change for decades as well but what are some of the trends you are seeing in solutions with machine vision when it comes to uh, let's say uh, in the last 3 4 5 years uh the biggest one is actually uh, the the final acceptance that smart cameras can't do it all uh for a very i would say for a 5 to 7 year period within uh the US market um coming in with a pc based solution was um kind of viewed with with, with a little bit of um sourness that with the number of challenges that were happening with windows based systems that were going on uh reliabilities um and so there was a perception that uh smart cameras with it being this own little black box can solve all the problems and um the reality is is that when you are dealing with high performance lines pc systems are still fundamentally what's going to end up driving uh high accuracy high reliability systems because you can do a lot more with them and work on that last few percentage to uh to improve consistency and reliability on a system um you know as as you were kind of previously talking about industrial machine vision is very different from academic machine vision uh equipment has to last 7 years reliability of the system you know 85% is completely unacceptable of uh, accuracy rate in in a manufacturing environment um in a lot of cases 995 is not considered acceptable when you're literally producing 1000 parts per minute having a small percentage of rejects ends up being a lot of product that gets a kicked off and so your system architecture and reliability components matters a lot and so with pcb systems you have to use you have to use industrial rated products with that and there's there's other challenges that that come into play uh the second thing that is um a really hot trend right now especially within the last 3 years is information transparency so having edge databases having analytics on your system their it within the last 5 years the manufacturing environment has been fighting a lot of issues with data security um there uh i have had clients where they've installed nasas and also come to find out that their drawings of their you know high end components were getting sucked out and and that information was going overseas in order to be you know duplicated so it's essentially industrial espionage and then there's also situations where it's getting down to the plc level in which there's malicious actors that are going in and causing issues and uh and such so that it has been focused on developing solutions and tightening down the networks and and all and also being able to support the perspective of okay well, how do we integrate everything but protect our networks so what's happening is more and more little silo systems are coming up where we need to deal with edge based databases in order to collect the information that is available that can be presented from the vision systems and so by keeping the information at the edge level and then it can essentially um at later points in time make backups of that information so it can be used uh, elsewhere that is the that is a trend that's starting to happen more more often it's just that it allows an extra wall of security between what is going on on the production floor level and also being able to meet the IT infrastructures at the regional and national level then you also have the trends of analytics so where prior before you would have guys that have been working on the line for 20 years 
and there's this general feel on uh take for example cheez-its so you know cheez-its you got this dough you know that dough has a little bit of feel to it and as it's starting to get rolled out it gets baked it gets cut and a lot of the guys um you know looking at it know when things are going to start going sideways well now what's happening is that they're trying to take some of that human intuition and okay how do we quantify it and so the with analytics and the study of, of it is now being able to take some of that learning information and translating it and developing trends and quantifying, you know, within uh, within that market. And then lastly, it's it's deep learning. It's it's been really interesting to see the transition of deep learning from academia into you know, the manufacturing environment. And uh, so taking um, something that requires more of a learning um, based uh, item where you're teaching the system what is good, you're teaching the system what is bad and allowing it over time to, to be able to differentiate that. And then it would then going and adding in rule-based um, information on the back end. So the combination of deep learning and machine vision together and getting those two environments is creating some truly powerful systems that are available today. Mm. Interesting. So, you know, a wide range of uh, interests. It's starting from the final acceptance of smart cameras is in the silver bullet all the way to uh, AI and deep learning. That's uh, so we, we still see a lot of misinformation, at least in Indian markets, where when it comes to you can't, you're comparing apples and oranges, you, you, you know, smart cameras with different PC based systems, and they're, they're all kind of uh, bucketized into a single category. And um, I think there's a lot of misinformation or lack of information that helps distinguish between different systems. And uh, yeah, part of this uh, effort is is to do these webinars, to do more of these sessions, to, to help spread some of that uh, information. Um, and so, uh, when it comes to uh, manufacturing, um, back to you, Suas. Now, what do you think is um, you know you, you talked about you know some of the failures with machine vision or and uh, you know, involving stakeholders and, and, and making sure that you're uh, you know, thinking about it from a holistic perspective. But what are some of the reasons why, you know, there's a number of projects that some come on the drawing board, they come into um, you know, consideration, but never take off. And from your experience, what, what do you think? Has that been something you've seen all, all the time? This, a lot of ideas being thrown out. They seem like good ideas, but they never actually uh, land on the ground. They never get traction. And what advice or what do you think are the reasons and what are some of the things you need to, to do to make sure that you actually implement some good ideas in on the uh, production floor? On the floor, on the floor, yeah. yeah. Um, very, very, very good question. Uh, because as I said earlier, uh, people get excited by technology. Uh, they jump on the bandwagon. And uh, I think I learned a lot from Robert today, a lot of good uh, insight uh, uh, into the different technologies and the challenges with that. So the problem is that these exciting technologies, the project manager, quality manager, whoever, right? He will see somewhere, he will create a project plan, some budget, and go to the whatever, right? GM, SVP, CEO, president. What is missing is like every other quality initiative. There is no business case. And somebody at your level, Robert's level, president, CEO, founder, they do not want to even hear about technology. Uh, for them, it's all about customers and the business top line, bottom line, right? And you can be excited. So they'll say, oh, great, that's fantastic. So what is it going to do for me and my business and my customer? So virtually on every quality initiative, this is what I have seen over the decades. It has improved in certain parts, but um, recently I had a lot of dialogues with some of the top company leaders in India because I'm working a lot in India right now. And the same feedback. 
there is no business case and i'll give you two examples of business case one robert brought to uh, so i'll take from that industry one of my friend is a very senior leader in purchasing in the biggest greens manufacturer in us all kinds of salads and the whole range they are the biggest it's 1. Point something billion dollar company so they have a lot of controls in place because it's hasap right it's all about people safety still week to week farm to farm month to month season to season the change in the color of the leaves the sag they sag they are not as crisp there there is no easy way to deploy the technology but there is a good business case so i'm trying to work with him along with my other solutions how to not completely repress the human calculate that daily loss weekly loss convert that into dollars convert that into the customer experience impact how you are losing your brand recognition right uh, second case right now it just happened last week uh, one of my customers here in vancouver they manufacture all their products in china and taiwan so they found out last week out of 1000 products they got here in the warehouse 300 so there is a typical uh, industry term here in north america it's called gift packing and final box right so you may have 20 of the same products inside in 300 of those there was wrong product than what it should have been so that's i'm working with him to create that business case so that his management and the partner understand how much money they are losing and boom you get an approval because i strongly believe and that's my personal experience over the decade every leader understands dollars rupees and secondly the customer experience everything else for them is the enabler they don't look at the ten technology as the end so you you said it very well in the beginning technology needs to be the enabler not the end game and end goal so create a strong business case focusing on non quality cost customer satisfaction uh, efficiency gains on the floor they always work right i've been doing this uh, my whole life and uh, fortunately uh, I, I i have a very strong sense of creating business case otherwise my life would have been miserable as a quality leader <laughs> okay yeah that's that's uh, very interesting and so you say you know really think about the problem we all get excited about technology but we forget about what it's the technology is going to do for us and you know just yep. kind of uh, picking uh, that point a little bit deeper you now if you if you were a um, practitioner you're thinking about a project you're in manufacturing or you're initiating a project now what how would you present that case right so if you are the ceo what would you you know practically what are some of the things you would what are the numbers or metrics that you would like to see is it are you looking for roi are you looking for you know uh, mm. you know in terms of uh, savings is it you know maintainability what are some of the key things or metrics that would drive uh, adoption or uh, mm. getting that project approved uh, very good question and uh, you partially already answered that so uh, what i have learned uh, even during my 20 years in india and uh, last uh, 10 15 years outside that's the number one metric every single leader understands appreciates and is looking for what is the roi if i give you a crore rupees or a million dollars when are you going to return that to the business right always that's the number one discussion and uh, the faster the roi is it a one year two year three years depends right every the type of project you you do and robert does, there is the roi takes a bit longer right it's a significant investment could be half a million dollars which is perfectly okay so that's number one second uh, efficiency gains right because right now i'm selling i'm selling three different solutions to a lot of leaders that's their second they understand that they don't ask you but they get it very quickly so your total cycle time is going to reduce third of course the quality output right um, they understand very well the defect rate uh, 
So whether you are improving from three to four percent inaccuracies in your pass fail decision criteria because of manual inspection, if you reduce that by thirty percent, forty percent, fifty percent, that is very well understood and appreciated because they are all about numbers. Ninety nine point nine nine percent leaders are all about numbers because they have pressure from the stakeholders. They have pressure from the market if it is a public company. That's how they are driven. That's how they are programmed. Um, and um, there is a better understanding over last decade, but more so in last 12 months, how important customer experience is. Every day you will hear and learn 70 to 80 percent businesses and are driven because of high CX. Those who are successful, their CX is the best in the industry, best in cars. Right? Everything they do is focused on customer. So those four, I would say, are the, um, and of course, non-quality costs, which is associated with two things. One is reducing the number of defects, uh, but uh, those are all tangible benefits. The biggest intangible benefit is employee satisfaction, which a lot of people don't understand. But when you enable the employees to do better, more value added job, and take these difficult tasks, they will be a lot more happy than what they are today. And uh, engagement goes up. You will see that in the output and efficiency. And if you're measuring your customer satisfaction, you will see significant gains, which is again, the management understands very well. Uh, because by and large leaders do talk to their customers, right? Either they talk proactively or customers call them when they're very happy or very unhappy. Or they go on Facebook, they go on LinkedIn and they yell at you. So, so those are the three, four key drivers. Um, uh, uh, and not boasting, but I have not seen any of my business case in the last 20 years ever get rejected when I followed this logic. And before that, I, I used to have tough time till I understood the language they understand. So that alignment uh, works. And last but not least, uh, what I'm hearing from uh, all the top leaders after COVID, uh, especially in US, Canada, I'm sure it's not much different globally. Last year, they did between 30 and 40% cost reduction across right? CapEx, OPEX. So people were let go, all the investments were stopped. Good to hear from Robert, at least they are thinking back, uh, especially US is doing a lot better. But every single rupee or dollar you will ask for next two to three years, it is going to be even more difficult if you don't have a business case. And as I showed you two examples, there are business cases. People are doing recalls because the quality team or operations team is not translating that into rupees and dollars and showing the management. If you invest this, you are not going to have these disasters after. It's very, very painful. I have done tens of global recalls. It's extremely painful and expensive. But that message needs to go uh, in those four terms they understand. Interesting, yeah, very, very insightful, uh, Suhas. So, uh, I think it's also important from uh, a solutions perspective because, like you said, it's we need to speak the language that customers want to hear because yeah. you know, they don't care about what technology we're using, you know, what software, whether it's deep learning or shadow learning, right? You know, it's it's really about what can you do for me, right? And a lot of times, I also uh, tell my team, and we 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 also have to remind ourselves that. It's not about our technology, it's about their problem. And uh, now, yep. same question yep. to you in terms of trends that you're seeing and some of the technologies being adopted, industry 4.0, automation, in uh, specific to the problem of quality control and management. You know, what are some of the things that has caught your eye, which you think is gaining some legs on the ground? Yeah. Uh, so there has been a bit of delay uh, in all the automation and deployment because of uh, COVID, but 
uh, I have been in touch with at least three or four uh, automation solution providers uh, doing what the front end of uh, what you do. So clearly, um, I see there are two big changes coming over the years going forward. Um, so one part is during the design phase, there is a huge need of automation. And the development cycle of typically any electrical electronic products is between 12 to 18 months. Uh, if you develop from scratch. Uh, and major part of that is the iterations which happen during the development phase, whether it is the EP engineering prototype and design validation, and then getting into mass production. Right? So the, the more you shorten these three phases, you are talking about crores of rupees saving because you are able to launch the product earlier. Uh, reduce the number of defects. So they are do doing very similar uh, machine vision. So there are a couple of companies which have come up um, and at least the vendors which are doing better today who are supplying mostly to medical and pharma, they are uh, piloting some of this technology to significantly reduce the whole design cycle and launch products faster. Again, ROI driven, right? It's again, huge ROI. So you're talking about significant millions of dollars saving on program. And the second phase is uh, during the manufacturing end-to-end -end process, uh, uh, along with uh, the machine vision of capturing the defects or qualifying defects, capturing critical data. Uh, I'm also seeing a lot of automation on the line, uh, smart uh, meters, uh, smart equipment, uh, being connected so that you gather all the data, the big data analysis, put it all in the cloud. So there is a good movement. It just got a bit of uh, setback, I would say. Uh, it will happen. There is no question. Because there are leaders who understand the value of all of this. And uh, th they do subscribe. Uh, so that those are the two things uh, I see. Yeah, they're going quite true. Oh, okay. And um, so just to, you know, uh, pause here to take some audience questions. So I see, you know, some uh, questions on the Q&A in the chat. So uh, anybody has any questions, please do uh, either type it out in the chat window. You can always also unmute yourself. You can unmute yourself, ask, introduce yourself and you know, have it more uh, li live as well. So feel free to, to ask your questions. So one question to Robert, you know, can you, can you give some more examples about uh, applications in the steel industry? So Robert, any um, in experience in the steel industry that you've seen with machine vision and, and what it can do? Um, A common application is with um, in manufacturing of, of sheet metal. So you will have these rolls, uh, continuous rolls of steel that is, or aluminum and such being produced. And if you have pinholes uh, within uh, the roll, uh, it can cause issues. And so the, it's not cost effective to actually stop production on these because it is truly a continuous process. So what's being done is they each roll has data that is associated with it that at this particular distance in on the product, there are these types of defects. And so that allows when that information gets sent, uh, when that steel roll gets sold, uh, so goes the data file that's with it. And so that this way, um, all that can be correlated together. Um, steel is, is very, um, it's a very old um, industry technology in which it's, it's kind of really cool to go into and see steel manufacturers. You know, some of these systems have been around for well over 50 years and the technology behind it um, hasn't changed a lot. It's just gotten a lot faster. And so and a lot of the dynamics behind that is, is part of it. And so um, it, it was very common for 
um, operators to sit and watch uh, these rolls of steel going by and basically hitting a button in order to indicate where you know the defect was you know within uh, within that role. Um, there's also applications where um, very much uh, I beams for um, buildings and such. Uh, a lot of that is now getting delivered literally uh, anywhere from a couple of days to no more than a week prior to when the iron workers need those I beams. So these um, architectural steel is literally being cut and and done within a couple of weeks of when it's going to get delivered. And so there's now dynamics on, okay, well, you know, how much bow do we have in this steel? And, um, you know, was all the little architectural elements where, you know, holes are being placed for connectors and end cuts, um, all those items now need to kind of get verified and such. Because if you have, you know, a couple I-beams that go out where um, the order process that, you know, they got mirrored, uh, that can impact uh, how quickly a building goes up. And that can be thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars of impact on a, on a project. So, so I hope that kind of answered that question. Oh, and something to add on to what Suaz was, was touching about. Um, with ROIs on, on machine vision and recalls, um, Ford back in uh, the early, I would say about mid 2000s, they implemented a program where every single uh, vision system images are archived. And literally when they go through and do a recall, they can trace back all the, uh, re trace back to a particular component and minimize the, uh, the impact of a recall. Now, the biggest challenge in barrier to entry for a lot of small manufacturers uh, for these like MES systems and, and, and such are, you know, a lot of these systems start off at $100,000. Well, having something, having an edge database where you're just taking a single line and you're taking the data information and recording certain bits of piece of information to a localized edge database is not that expensive in order for key high value components. So going and tracking where you're doing a value add where there may be seven different components that are added to the process and you're uh, and that is a high value component that's getting sold out. Having an archive that can be generated and be reviewed upon um, can easily reduce the impact. So we have one automotive customer where um, there's a, a an engine head that goes through a number of different stations. And each of those stations add value to the product. And then there's different test stations that validate the, um, the how sound the components are and, and such. So what we had done is we collected and pulled all the information associated with that engine head, all the test data, and put it into a little edge database. And we associated uh, the barcode that was uh, dot pinged into the side of the project. And so now whenever they have a recall, they can go in, they can pull up all the engine heads that were produced within that date and see what the test results were that. And so they can mitigate you know, how many products that they need to go back and, and review. Yeah, interesting. And, and um, yeah, even uh, Suhas and I have had some discussions and he's also mentioned about, you know, it's not just about the inspections, all the data that you're collecting, the traceability that you will get, you know, the benefits of machine vision as, you know, uh, a data uh, gold mine, as, as it puts it. Which, so, you know, so I'll quickly add uh, yeah. to Robert's point. Um, so um, in 97, uh, I bought a brand new Maruti Suzuki. And within less than six months, there was a recall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mukund steel in Mumbai and the problem was pinholes on the steering wheel steel used. Imagine they had to do a full recall all across India, uh, give me another car for a couple of days. So all customers are, so they took the car from the house, they replaced everything they needed to, significantly expensive. That's the business case for doing automation. So fortunately, um, Marut Suzuki has tremendous recognition in India. If it was any other brand, they would have gone down with, because it was a safety risk. 
my steering once got locked when i was driving at 70 mm. 80 kilometers the defect failure mode was because of this prop defect with the steel the steering would get locked in a position imagine how many people could die so that's a very very strong business case when your product defect is going to di- either directly impact lives or productivity of your customers very easy to translate into rupees and dollars right yeah that's that's, that's true yeah we we work across steel as well and you know it's it's a very challenging application uh, when it comes it to yeah. it's high speed there's hot strip mills the rolling mills and uh, you know wide field of views but uh, yes. i see a lot of potential and and i think uh, one thing would love to lo- understand from the audience so if you uh, uh, those who are still around thank you so much you know we, we we have a second poll we'd love to get some insight into which industry that you work with so you can you know just start the second poll um, you know please do enter you know which industry are you representing automotive pharma fmcg others in academics and uh, just get a sense of and if it's others then please do type out you know what you have so any other questions in the meantime while the poll is running and we can get some of the audience questions as well so uh, somebody asked about applications of Hey, last sound. Oh, sorry. Was in uh, you'd hope. Hope I was uh, audible. But yeah, while the poll is running, just get some other questions around uh, audience questions. So yeah, some three of you: automotive, FMCG, consumer electronics, and others. And yeah, if you could type in what others is in your chat, if it's academics or anything else, please do. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you. um so another question applications of ai in machines okay now there's machines and then uh, machine vision as well so couple of things that come to mind in you know uh, in machines is predictive maintenance i've seen that a lot using artificial intelligence to uh, take the sound uh, of machines and build an intelligent model depending on uh, the time series uh, data and sound to identify patterns of defects so early warning breakdowns so number of companies that are working that very interesting uh, application and of course machine vision also has a number of applications so i let robert speak on you know applications of ai in machine vision if you could talk about a few like deep learning based applications So I did an interesting project um a few years ago where um currently uh baby chickens go through a fogger in order to vaccinate them. And what if you consider, you know, there you know, even within the US we eat something like a billion pounds of chicken a year. So with the current vaccination rate, even if you were to improve by a couple percentage points a billion ends up being a huge impact so there was an sbr project where we were brought in as a subject matter expert and they wanted to evaluate the feasibility of using deep learning to spray vaccine directly into the baby chicks eyes and so literally within our office we had boxes of baby chicks where we were imaging them and determining the head orientation so we can provide that feedback information in the future to uh where the head was located in order to activate a particular sprayer so that was by far my most interesting uh deep learning project uh, most of what i'm doing uh today is looking for uh anomalies uh, in a uh, foreign material uh porosity in materials and so uh in you know particular rubber uh you know being able to find uh cracks uh voids divots um porosity issues uh surface texture problems it's um it's very labor intensive because not all the defects are readily available and the specs for them are not well defined 
So part of our process is we go through and generate uh, an image annotation guide. And then we distribute out to a, a team to go through and label our images. Now, what's interesting with the US market is that uh, there's a sensitivity of information leaving uh, the, uh, the, basically the continental US. So it's not acceptable to have, let's say, uh, images from a US manufacturer be hand labeled by a team in Africa, by a team in Costa Rica, or a team in India. And so we have to source that um, locally in order to, um, to, to implement that. And so um, deep learning applications, especially complex ones, they, um, they present a little bit of a challenge within the US market because of that data sensitivity. But uh, you know, very common uh, you know, within US market textiles, uh, rubber, uh, leather, you know, looking for foreign materials, um, voids, pits, um, you know, within the leather market, um, you know, uh, a tick going can easily go and impact the quality of leather. And so knowing where uh, to cut, uh, you know, for particular patterns can be avoided. And so there are some manufacturers that are looking to utilize um, uh, deep learning you know, within that environment. But it, it can also be ceramics. Uh, you know, ceramics have a particular uh, surface finish that's required in it to hold its integrity, especially with ceramic filters. So uh, a ceramic filter's quality can be very dependent upon, uh, you know, the overall surface finish on it. And, and, though, and so using deep learning to uh, address those applications. So it's, um, it, it's, it's been very interesting the trend within the, the US market on the, it, um, there's a certain degree of low hanging fruit that is possible with deep learning, where you don't need, uh, where you can get away with providing, let's say 500 instances of, uh, of an application and types of defects. Um, but more complex ones are, are much larger. And part of that has to do with, um, you know, so deep learning networks to a certain extent, it's about teaching how to find um, strengths and weaknesses in, in signals. And so there's different approaches to that. And so um, things like ImageNet uh, provides a, an excellent precursor in how to find things within an image. And then you can build, uh, uh, build networks on top of it. And so if you take a look at commercial packages like from, uh, from Cognex and from MV Tech and such, um, they, they have years and years of images uh, archived in which they've collected that and provided pre-trained networks and how to find defects and, and such. So it's, it's, it's really interesting to kind of see the development on it. Because ImageNet for a while, there was questions on whether or not that could be used within a commercial application. And so if your algorithms were based on uh, ImageNet precursor, uh, uh, then whether or not there would be a problem later on. And it's, uh, it is very common within the US market that when you have terms and conditions, they are thrown out the window by large manufacturers. And so the indemnity clauses that are required um, by some of the uh, US manufacturers um, mitigate, you, you have to be aware of what your risks are when you're using open source software and, and uh, things that are based on open source software. And so that's why there's a tendency to use commercial packages uh, within the US market instead of home brewing your, uh, your own in-house solutions. Mm. Yeah, that's, and, and, you know, basically the way uh, we, we think of deep learning and AI applications is, you know, um, we think of whatever the human uh, is doing today on the assembly lines, right? So if, you're, if a human is able to do it, then it's a great application for AI. So just like a lot of artificial uh, products, this artificial uh, material, artificial sweeteners, artificial uh, cotton is artificial intelligence. So this whatever is the replication of the natural intelligence, the human intelligence. And 
but uh, yeah, that's a, a, a lot. That's a very, very 10,000 foot answer. And then I think Robert, you explained that with more examples, with a specific applications all the way to, you know, uh, ImageNet, by the way, is a, is a, is a model. There's, uh, you know, a database of, uh, of uh, a specific model that all the industries, all the uh, industries benchmarked against. And so the benchmark was how it classified against that benchmark. And there was uh, the, uh, a common a competition called large scale visual recognition challenge, which actually uh, put machine against man. And they would say, you know, me, uh, humans were asked to classify images and then the same would then be uh, classified by machines. And up until 2000 and early 2000s, there's always the, the humans that won over machines. And then that's when the, the scale tipped, like the tipping point and where deep learning really started to take off and it surpassed human accuracies. And so today machines are, you know, a lot more uh, intelligent and can be trained with enough data. Uh, so it's a combination of data and model which, which can surpass uh, any human in the loop in applications. And we've seen this over and over again with a number of applications that we, uh, we've also developed. So a uh, lot of applications, huge potential, and it's just getting better and better and better. So, so I, I have two comments on that. Uh, connecting with what Robert said uh, and my earlier uh, business case situation, right? There is a lack of awareness and understanding as to what AI DL can do. Two live cases I'm involved right now uh, on LinkedIn in two dialogues, right? One is uh, in Canada and major parts of US now, uh, marijuana has become legal. You can buy and consume, no problem, right? It's bad. So what I realized two weeks back, and I tagged you, uh, Nadi, um, this industry is having a huge challenge. They are highly regulated, right? Both, I, I don't know, I think it's called dosage. Uh, you are allowed so much. I, I never tried, so I don't know. But it's both. Uh, the packaging has two numbers, uh, which are, if you miss one decimal, it's a recall situation. Right? One is the gram and one is the strength. And there are so many recalls going on right now. And I checked with one of my quality connects here in Vancouver. There are like 20 companies. We are, it looks like the capital of my pot in the world, right? She's putting people to inspect and read that. I said, seriously? You can't, right? At that speed, 100% accuracy every single time, two ships a day or three ships a day. It's humanly impossible, right? So there is an immediate need in the market. So I'm trying to connect the dots that guys, there are solutions out there. And so let's see. Other is um, the disaster which happened in US, 15 million doses of uh, COVID vaccine had to be thrown in the dustbin. So I was talking to some of the biggest quality leaders in pharma in US over LinkedIn, and we are fully aligned. There is a huge gap, they are not, looks like this plant has not implemented any kind of automation when two different lines and operators cross the line and he carried the contamination and that's why we are where we are. So I proposed a lot of suggestions from my industry and we were aligned. She said, yeah, that's what we need. We need automation. We need to track this human as he walks and then you have to ensure that he really cleans himself in a room before he gets out. So that's all vision, right? It's vision, AI, ideal. So yeah. I think there is a lack of a conduit who can understand the problems and translate what solution fits, right? So uh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. There, is, there are a lot of uh, challenges which need solution for sure. There is no question in my mind. And it's, and in its technologies like, AI deep learning, which is enabling it, but you know, it's all a combination of the right business case, application of it, system architecture, as Robert mentioned, not one technology, there's not just one element of that which can provide this you know, relief. And it's, it's, it is complex, no doubt. And it does require specialized thinking. It requires stakeholder buy-in, so, yes. you know, we talked about, you know, what are some of the reasons for 
you know, things not taking off. And uh, although it's as exciting a time as any to be looking into technologies like machine vision, AI, automation, it also involves a lot of complex complexities, challenges, and thinking from a diverse perspective. And I think uh, we, uh, with a lot of insights that was gained, there's, uh, I'd, I'd like to sort of close officially the, the webinar. So, so once again, thank you so much, Suhas and Robert for participating and joining in, all the audience. Thank you for the opportunity. Right. And, uh, right. and thank you. And, and, and thank you so much for the audience who stayed back late. And uh, the number of you, I think, have to be dropped off. But, you know, this recording is going to be uh, this. This is going to be recorded and shared live. We see a number of recordings. People, uh, you know, there, there were over 200 registrants and more than more, most of them, the majority of them actually view it, you know, after the fact because of timing issues. So this is going to be viewed and for those of you who would love to take a look at this later on, there's a recording that will be shared with you. Please do share it on with your friends and colleagues who think that this will be useful. And um, also if uh, there's any uh, solutions or anything that kind of resonated with you, do reach out. Uh, you have our contact details and we'd love to have a chat with you about the specific applications or problems that you'd like to solve and we'll, we'll be happy to uh, engage in the dialogue and uh, with that you know uh, we'll stick around for a few more minutes but uh, any questions we'll, we'll, we'll be happy to take but this kind of concludes the official uh, webinar series so if you feel you feel free to uh, drop off get some dinner and uh, once again stay safe it's a it's a really uh, bad time in terms of what's happening out there I know a number of people personally uh, affected by it. And I just really hope that we're through this together and, and can uh, come back to, you know, as whatever semblance of normalcy that we can find. So uh, any questions you, have to, uh, yeah, yes, yeah, so please. That one is, uh, thanks a lot, Robert. I learned a lot today to, from you. Uh, and coming back to AI and DL and ML and the current problem, few camera manufacturers like Avigil and Axis, they have launched cameras last year with thermal imaging deployed for a particular, ensuring that there is six feet distance and so on and so on, right? Yeah. So properly utilized, this technology is phenomenal. I saw there is a question that AI can be misused. Believe me, any technology can be misused. And this example will go very well with Indian audience. I give it in all my quality training. A tool is as good as the user. If you remember your grandfather or dad used to use a topaz blade for shaving. That blade in India was used for three different applications. Shaving, which is its original intent. Very nice, good. I have used and every other kid of my age uh, from the six seventies, we have used it to- uh, Sharpen uh, pencils? Sharpen our pencil. <laughs> and in, yeah. in Mumbai, Pune, and Delhi, it was used either to cut people's throat or oh steal from your in, inner pocket without you even realizing. Imagine, right? Four different applications, same great tool. So AI is like any other tool. It's up to you, me, and who are involved to ensure that the usage is appropriate. It's not hurting humans, but it's helping us to do something better, not sitting and inspecting crap. <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, I know. And, and see, there's a lot of uh, AI, you know, misuse of technology where you've seen how you can superimpose voice with, you know, I, there's this classic example of how, you know, Obama is making this really, you know, it's clear that it's not Obama, right? Because of what he's saying, but not because of how he says it or his voice or his features. It's just that you know that, okay, knowing Obama, he wouldn't say something like that. And uh, you, know, you can- every, every important have, leader in the US, India, uh, whenever there are elections, these guys come out and they do a lot of damage, yes. Yeah, and then they have fake clippings, which, uh, which aren't true and AI can aid in that. So that's you know, uh, another example of how technology can be misused in today's day, day and age. Um, 
And then, okay, there's another question for Robert. There was, uh, Robert, do you use vision, vision to check your red wine bottles? Okay, so specific application of... of, of. So there's um, a couple questions related to um, image labels. Uh, and so for majority of labels, it can be done with traditional vision. So uh, you present uh, you present the label, and then you're verifying is there uh, variations with from the template, and where are kind of things shifted or misprints or missing print. Um, that's very much you don't need AI to solve that. Now, applications where AI does work well is uh, dealing with lot and date codes. So. Uh, Typically, you see, if you look at, there's a couple of different technologies, uh, VideoJet is one of them, where you have a literally spraying on little dots of ink on the side of the product. And so that, depending on line speed and coordination, and there's a number of things that can, dynamics that come into play that affects the consistency of the print. But from a human perspective, we can still say that, yes, that particular product is going to expire in October and it was made from lot one, two, three. And so deep learning has started to allow uh, improvement on allowing more product to be able to get through without being rejected because you can teach the variances and the relationships of the text as it's printing on the side of the label. Um, other applications for deep learning is things like wrinkle detection and um, bubbles underneath labels and, and things like that. What machine vision is really good at is uh, detecting what is different from the standard. And so then it's a matter of, and then even though you've, you've trained it in a lot of good examples, and you know, being presented at, hey, this is this is different, and so that's where um, deep learning has a, has a huge value within um, inspection of the labels. Yeah, thank you, Robert. And and uh, any experience with red wine inspection, like maybe uh, I, I have no applications with cork insertion sealing on the cap with the bottles. Anything that's that in, basically all the kind of the standard stuff. Um, I'm not as I'm not really in wine country. Uh, we do have a, you know a local wine that's muscatine, but that's done by small producers. So um, it, it's also about um, machine vision accessibility is sometimes dependent on how much product is getting produced. And so I guess who I was pointing out, it's about the business case. And so for small providers, it is sometimes just doesn't make sense to implement machine vision if you're if it's low. So a lot of times what happens is that you go and get a used smart camera off of eBay, you know, where you can get it at a 50% discount. And that's fairly common within our industry. Um, just buyer beware on buying lights off of eBay. Uh, a lot of times those, uh, the intensity on those lights, uh, there's a longevity aspect to them that if those lights were used where they were constantly on, the reason they're being sold on eBay is because the intensity is dropped in half. Uh, whereas if it's uh, a used, if it's a really good light, there's no reason that it's going to be on eBay. <laughs> it's, it's still being in use. So um, yes, you can get some quality uh, smart uh, smart cameras and such off of eBay, but um, unless you want to kind of pick up lights for your lab and experiment with, do not use use lights on in a production environment. Like even if you're, like, especially if you're like a, a small manufacturer and you're trying to, uh, you know, do it in house and you know try and save costs, that's uh, it is not worth it. Okay, um, I guess the question came because the Ravi noticed a red wine bottle near your rack, so that's. He was curious whether that was your sample or that was something for consumption. Uh, uh, no, that's um, um, the 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 vermouth bottle doesn't fit in the, the, the shelf. It's too tall for the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, yeah. So that's that's why it's there. So it's, it's reserved uh, for a uh, celebration. <laughs> well, sometimes after a long week, um, you know, a, a dirty martini, you know, on a Friday, you know, when you're still here at seven nine o'clock at night. You know, and sometimes it's just, uh, you know, just the way it works. 
right. so one one last comment on the what robert just said right the business case so there is always a threshold uh, to the risk appetite of every business based on where they are what their product is and what it will cost to the market right you are in a regulated industry where you are going to cause harm kill somebody there should be zero fact there should be zero appetite for any risk taking versus in a wine or a beer or a consumer product if you can live with couple percentage failures either fictitious or true you are going to always evaluate the business case okay i can live with this couple percent i'll keep replacing i'm not going to automate which is not a wise decision but that's how leaders decide they don't see the complete picture uh, it's not just about the number of failures and the dollars or rupees it's what it causes to your customers right they have many options today on amazon they go to somebody else so convert that into the business case yeah yeah, yeah. so with, with that i think um, i don't see any other questions and uh, we could probably uh, call it a wrap and thanks again all of you, you. for attending and uh, also uh, staying back asking your questions participating and like uh, stay safe have a great night and uh, have a great day wherever else you are and uh, talk to you soon thank you for the opportunity great dialogue good to know robert i can bug him offline now yeah awesome. and thank yeah, you great opportunity. it's been a pleasure great to, uh, thank you have a great day stay safe yeah bye bye bye